are listening to Let's Talk More Action. I'm your host today. I'm Cameron. And I'm with here, Sharon Price, our executive director. What's going on, Sharon? Hey, Cameron. How's it going today? Oh, I'm so hungry, Sharon. I don't know what to do. Oh, listen, if you'd been at my house last night, you would have been in eating heaven. Oh, no. Yes, what? Yes, what did you yes, do? Yes, 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 yes. I've been practicing on those famous Louisiana meat pies. Oh my, it was no, the second Sharon, time I'm getting on. better and better, Cameron. Come on, Sharon. You know I want one of those. <laughs> I, I thought about what you last I? night. No, I thought about you last night. I told my husband, I said, I've got to save a few for Cam. He was like, eh, eh, not <laughs> this know. time. He can I, get in next time. I can't time. even believe you even put me out there like that. Like, yes, I did. <laughs> yes. I told him, I said, I got to make up with Cameron, you know, and I was planning to use those meat pies. Yes, but, uh, yes, They yes. didn't make it. They did not make I've it. I've been looking at meat pies on social media just dreaming. Just dreaming for days, like maybe one day I'll be able to sit at the table and get a meat pie. <laughs> well, you know, that's a labor of love. You don't make meat pies to feed your family. You make it because you love your family. Oh. And so I'm trying to keep my my, my little husband happy oh, with me right now. That's okay. what I'm, Yeah, I've made some New Year's resolutions. And I know. <laughs> yeah, I've been on a roll. I've been now eight days in a row that I've cooked. So oh, my I'm, goodness. Mm, they, they checking you to see if you got a fever, got that Rona. <laughs> I know. I've, look, I've been get, getting extra hugs and kisses, so oh I'm happy goodness. about it. Yes. That's, that's, that's a blessing right there. <laughs> man, oh, man. But today is a very special day. It's a very beautiful day. We have taken the show on the road. Yes. And Sharon knows, and we don't take the show on the road. We, we don't take the show on not the road. For, not just for anybody. Not for mm -hmm. just anybody, but... Today, who's going to be on our show today? Today, we have Charles Booker on the show. He has been very active, you know, in the last year. He's got a lot of things going on. So, Charles, just want to welcome you to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm humbled. And uh, I'd like some meat pie, too. Uh, listen, listen. I'm taking orders. I'm Wait a minute. Step I, back. I know. I'm going to have to tell my husband, Charles. Charles says that he wants some meat pies. <laughs> Listen, I'm working on it, so I'm getting better and better at it. The first ones didn't come. They were they were ugly, let me tell you. But the ones <laughs> last night, yes, I'm not going to give up on it. Oh no way. Oh, my goodness. This is great. So tell us, while we got you here, tell us, what have you been doing? I saw that your position ended um, th uh, December 31st yeah. um, as a 43rd um, state representative from the House. So tell us about that and some of the things and your experiences with that and then what you're doing now. Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you again for having me and for getting on the road a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure to come down your way. We'll make it up to you. There um, it is. You know, what I've really been doing is all I can. Mm. Um, my, my term did end uh, December 31st. So uh, I've been state representative for the 43rd District, uh, which covers a very um, broad swath of Jefferson County. It goes as far west as you can go to the river, the west end. The hood, that's where mm -hmm. I'm from. That's me. Uh, then that's it cuts me. through downtown Central Business District. We're actually uh, right within it now. Um, and then it goes east to Indian Hills. So it has some of the wealthiest and some of the poorest parts of Jefferson County and therefore the state in that district. And it's been a privilege of my life to, to serve in that capacity. And uh, really what led me to run is what I'm working on now. Uh, how do we end poverty? How do we break these cycles that make poverty be something that gets passed down from generation to generation uh, like it has in my family and really trying to inspire what I'm calling a movement of Kentuckians standing up and fighting back because we got a lot of work to do. Okay. That's the hood to the holler, right? Tell it us sure about is. that. Tell us, you know, how do you plan to do that? Well, first of all, as you see, I got the, the hoodie on. <laughs> this is indeed uh, an effort to transform not only our politics, but just our, our, our way of looking at who matters and who doesn't. Um, our way of telling a, a new story of what Kentucky really is and can be and should be and acknowledges some real truths about Kentucky and that we are at the bottom in essentially everything and it doesn't have to be that way. Mm. Um, now, I'm from the church, so bo okay. both my parents are ministers. <laughs> yeah, all right, and uh, if you know anything about the church, there's a lot of call and response. Mm -hmm. And, you know, their storytelling. You take people on a journey. Uh, the ministry is about how do you get people from where they are 
to where they're trying to go. And, and you got to cast a vision. And so I'm always trying to tell the story. And growing up in the West End, you know, I felt isolated. I felt like no one cared about us. Poverty is concentrated and generational. I've seen um, people get arrested, um, their lives thrown away. I've had cousins murdered the last five years. And it's a story that when you go into the halls of government, it's not adequately discussed or if at all. And I went to Frankfurt uh, as a legislator, which we'll talk about. And I saw a lot of these conversations that would happen about um, challenges across Kentucky with poverty and, and health. I'm a type one diabetic. I've had to ration my insulin because I couldn't afford it. And, and I'm hearing conversations and, and I'm like, wait a minute, y'all talking about me, but you don't see me. Right. right, right. And the fact of the matter is a lot of Kentuckians all over the Commonwealth feel that way. And so when I was running for Senate, I wanted to say, you know what, I see you. Mm -hmm. And we're going to lift our voices together, even from the forgotten places, even from the hood and even from the hollers and everywhere mm -hmm. in between. And, and it became uh, really the, the rallying cry for um, this movement to transform Kentucky. And so uh, I didn't win the primary, which I know we're going to talk about. But what we won was so much bigger because we inspired people to believe things could be different. And now we're building power ourselves. And so that's what Hood to the Holler is all about. We're activating people across Kentucky to build our power individually and collectively so that we can lead, be citizen lobbyists, we can organize, we can end poverty, we can pull up racism by the roots. Well, I like, the way, I like the way you say that it doesn't have to be. You know, you might yeah. not realize this, but we have a lot in common that's not so in common. You're a Kappa, I'm a Delta. You're a Head Start alum, I'm a Head Start parent. Right. You know, so we've got a lot of things in common um, that may not be so in common. You know, but we also have that we came from poverty in common. And so looking at us and where we are today and the things that we've had to overcome in order to make that change, we know that it can happen. That's right. You know, and, but how do we get that to the masses of people who are living in poverty? How do yeah. we change that? From your perspective, what do you think about that? What has to be done? We talk a lot about uh, legislation that's in place um, that's not very helpful for folks with low income, right? right? You know, that's set up against them. What kind of legislation could be changed that would make an, an e immediate impact to people that are living in poverty? You know, well, one of the first things we have to do um, when we're looking at legislation, programs, policies, budgetary allocations, we have to prioritize poverty. Oftentimes, it's, uh, it's in the periphery. It's, it's something that we just deal with as if it's always supposed to be there. We never really lead into saying we're going to end it. Uh, we're going to prioritize it and understand that it is it's comprehensive. It touches every part of our lives. We criminalize it. Um, we, we navigate around it when folks are, are battling and not getting food to eat <laughs> and don't have a roof over their head, can't afford their medication, um, are disenfranchised. I mean, it, it touches everything. And so, you know, one of the things that I, I, I really lifted up in my campaign for Senate, which was actually building on my work throughout the years. I worked in every level of government, um, and I, I was always the good troublemaker, making my mm -hmm. way into all, all right. these spaces, trying to figure <laughs> out how they work. And to me, the short of it is we have to invest directly in people. Um, programs are great. Every person we can help is important, but we have to change the system. And that goes to how we directly invest in people where they are. Um, and so, you know, I talk about universal health care, uh, talk about uh, universal basic income, something Dr. King spoke about. Um, I, I talk about a Green New Deal. I talk about reparations. Mm -hmm. I talk about the fact that we have to invest in people where they are and account for justice and humanity in a real way. And then all the other policies build out of that. And, and you know, I'm excited to see the growing momentum uh, to really do that deep rooted work. Mm -hmm. and, and when you're talking about that, I'm sorry, Cam, when you're talking about that, it brings to mind the difference between equality and equity. That's right. And so what does that mean? What does that mean to you? And how will you um, use that in your platform? You know, um, it's, it's interesting. So you all may have seen some videos of me on the House floor. Uh, there was one in particular where, you know, they cut my mic off. And I was yelling out my you life. You were silenced. Too. Oh, <laughs> silenced. I, I, I had to get silenced. My, you got the button. So you're going to turn my <laughs> mic off, but you're going to still hear me. Uh, but, <laughs> but, you know, one of the things that I was explaining and saying that, you know, my life matters too is, you know, acknowledging, one, the, the reality of my humanity 
and understanding that we got to tell this bigger story that pulls people in. Um, we have to tell the story that is not heard and that is left out. And to me, honestly, that's the biggest key. Um, when I would go across Kentucky and I would tell my story and I would listen, uh, we would figure out every time, never fails, how much we have in common. Mm -hmm. And when we see those common bonds, now we can build with something. Now we can work together. Um, it was proven true for my time in the legislature, and, and I've seen it across Kentucky, so I know that we can get it done. Well, you know, one of, one of the things that I always think about when you talk about the things that we have in common, nobody is going to agree on everything, right? That's right. Nobody's going to agree. And all of the things that I, that I said about us, you being a cap and me being a Delta, you being from Head Start, me being a Head Start mom, those things are different, but they're the same. That's right. And there's nothing wrong with being different. And, mm -hmm. and honestly, if, you, if you're talking to somebody and you agree on everything, somebody's lying. Oh. You know, <laughs> uh -oh. and, uh, he's just said it. And, you know, and so that's why I center my conversation on structural inequity. Um, we, we often look at racism um, and inequity on a person to person level and we don't see the system. And I think we can tell the story better, one, by making it clear that when people use the word uh, equality, they're missing a whole lot of context. Mm -hmm where you know, there is no such thing as pull yourself up by your bootstraps. If you don't have when, boots, you can't well, do it. Well, when well. your boots were taken away, yeah. mm. and, and you were robbed of any opportunity to get to the boot store because the boot store was taken away. Right. You know, and so we have to be clear about that. We're talking about a fight for justice, and I think when you lift up equity, you're able to lift up justice. Um, and when we do that, we create a playing field where everyone can thrive, and equality will naturally arise because we've leveled the playing field in a real way. And I think one of the things, too, is that a lot of the things that are brought out by politicians do, when they're running are things that we don't know. Like we don't know that uh, we're, we're way behind in education until it's brought up. And I, and I think that's a travesty because we could be the number one uh, basketball team and, and, and we'll pump that up. But you know what I'm saying? The things that really matter that bring people out of their positions, out, out of their conditions, yeah. we're not really even talking about. Well, you know, one of the things that um, our good, my good friend, Representative George Brown says, is that everybody has a lobbyist except poor people. Yeah. That's another good brother, too. Yes, I, <laughs> I, I, like him, I like him quite a bit. But, you know, that's one of the things that he talks about very frequently yeah. is, you know, you, who, who is the voice and who is speaking on behalf of people that have low income? Yeah. You know, because that invisible, it's easy to put the blinders on and not see the ugly side of what's going on. Right. You it's know, convenient. and it just doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, very it, convenient. It's convenient. And, and, you know, truthfully, it's not really intentional for the majority of folks. Mm -hmm. Because if your lived experience is rooted in perpetuating inequity, you just think it's a part of uh, the daily life. And honestly- It's just the way it is. You, know, you start to believe it. it, it that's right. And I, I'm, I'm working on a book to tell this story in a broader sense too. And I'm, it's gonna be called From the Hood to the Holler. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so we're breaking a little bit of news here. Um, Look at that. Ah, breaking news breaking on the show, news. yes. You heard All it. right. Yeah, yeah so I'm, I'm working to tell this story, um, you know, because of the, the fact that one of the things we have to realize is, you know, if we're trying to get to the heart of how we transform Kentucky, how we transform our future, we cannot leave these truths behind. And, you know, I, I think it just gives us the incredible opportunity to, to shine a light on what's actually happening in Kentucky that we don't get to see yeah. because so many people don't get heard. Yeah. Um, our voices mm -hmm. are not accounted for. And this isn't partisan. And that's the part that's, that's powerful yes. about it. It's mm -hmm. bigger than party. It's bigger than geography. The fact that you are fighting to end poverty is something that can bring us all together because we all know what that's about in one way or another in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. um, that gives us a chance to build. And, and when you mentioned that no one gets heard, that is why Hood to the Holler is so focused on training people to be citizen lobbyists. Because Representative Brown is right, which means we have to lift our own voices up and have our own agenda and advocate for ourselves and as soon as we understand how to do that, we can get anything done. Well, you said two things that, that just hit me. You talked about transformational and you talked about the heart. You ta also talked about things that can be changed legislatively, yeah. um, you know, to make a difference. But how do you change what's in somebody's heart? And that's what I want to hear from you when we come right back from this commercial break. All right. All right.
Community Action Council Prep Academies offer free early childhood education and comprehensive services to children birth to five years old and their families. This school year, parents and families can choose the Head Start learning option that best fits the need of their child and family, whether it's virtual or with their Head Start program or in-person learning. The choice is yours. To enroll your child in one of their Prep Academies or in Head Start at Home, call the Community Action Council today at 859-233-4600 or by going online at C-O-M-M-A-C-T-I-O-N.org. That's comaction.org. Community Action Council is launching Help for Home, a local initiative to raise funds for rental assistance for families who have been economically impacted by COVID-19 and are now facing the threat of eviction. You know, it seems that two of the most frequently used words over the last few months has been the phrase at home. For some right now, those words are stirring up a sense of fear and uncertainty as thousands in our community are still struggling from the loss of a job or from being underemployed. For others, those words are stirring up a sense of gratitude and a deep desire to help. It is our hope that Help for Home can be the bridge for that help. If you would like to contribute, you can donate easily any amount of money by texting the phrase Help for Home to the number 243725. If you would like to give online or by check, please visit our website at comaction.org. Thank you for helping us help others stay in their homes. During these very difficult times, Community Action Council is on the front lines, caring for our neighbors as we have over the past 55 years. We are safely helping individuals and families access shelter, food, energy assistance, and health care. We're also ensuring families with young children have baby formula and diapers. We're continuing to prioritize education using virtual learning to help us teach our Head Start children and engage our youth. Things look a little different right now, but we are Community Action Council and we're made for this. You're listening to Let's Talk More Action, and our special guest today is Mr. Charles Booker. Thank you, thank you, thank you. (laughs) Well, listen, I'm ready to pick up right where we left off after commercial break. We were having a little bit of conversation, you know, during the break about changing people's hearts. You've got a little bit of a different perspective about that. I do, I do. I, I don't believe that the work is about changing someone's heart. I think it's about shining a light and understanding that there are some core values that we all hold. And if we do the work of breaking the barriers down, the silos down that keep us divided, those, those tenets we all hold as human beings will naturally come to the, the forefront of how we show up in our community, in our society. And the result is more equity. The result is this idea of being unified because of these things that we all hold dear. And, um, as simple as it is in my mind, I realize how complex it is because we deal with structural racism and we have been divided. And one of the things that Hood to the Holler is trying to lift up and tell the story about is how we create a new Southern strategy. Tell me about that. Absolutely. Um, One thing you got to understand how pervasive and how powerful our politics are and how they are tethered directly to racism and how investments in communities, who succeeds and who doesn't, how we have built up our institutions that have blocked certain people out, whole swaths of people out, is all rooted to this idea of building politics, particularly in the South, around race and using this concept of other to drive wedges into communities that have so much in common naturally. Um, And this affects the majority of us. And I I think that's it it rises up now in a message that's sort of populist, um, that speaks to regular people fighting back, taking our power back, not being victims, but understanding that now we're going to take our authority and lead for the future ourselves. And it's rooted in love. I mean, it, it's the uh, the antithesis of what we see now with hate. The greatest of yeah. these is That's love. Right. Mm-hmm. That is, yeah. that, and it's rooted in love, it's rooted in family, and it gives us the chance to talk about issues that we often avoid because they're uncomfortable or they're not politically expedient. Um, it was the most humbling thing for me uh, to go to parts of Kentucky. Uh, I was a director of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, I don't know if you. I didn't know that. You know if you knew that. Yeah. Wow, you got yeah, deep so, in the woods. So it was just a couple of people uh, in the department that looked like me. Um, definitely the, uh, the only one that came from where I come from. Uh-huh. And um, the majority of the department was around 700 employees when it, you include seasonal and temp. Um, the majority of the, uh, the department was white. 
and you know a, a lot of the leanings were conservative and you know what i understood when i started traveling across kentucky is how we've been systemically divided for generations when we're fighting so many of the same things and and how ready we are to get past this as soon as we have the chance because there's a natural inclination to want to survive and when we realize we can survive if we fight together yeah. people will do it and right. and and I was able to show up as a young black man from 35th and Market in places that were had a history of overt racism 99% white and I would tell my story and the response would be thank you and here's mine and I never knew you all dealt like the, dealt with that in the West End I didn't know you had internet that was trash like ours too. I didn't know <laughs> you didn't have places to shop because That's groceries, right. you deal That's with right. that too. You got dollar stores and liquor stores everywhere too. I mm. didn't know. Mm -hmm. Why don't we do something about it together? That's what a new Southern strategy is about. It flips our politics on, our, on its ear and it's how you can win in places like Kentucky. Mm -hmm. It's how you can do what, you d what, what we saw in Georgia. Um, we can yes. build this very new um, and very obvious coalition and change our future. Well, I'm, I'm excited about change for the future because anything that affects any, anybody in your community, whether, whether you think that you are immune to it or not, you're not. That's right. Poverty, racism, all of this affects everybody that lives in individual communities. And so I'm interested to see um, how that's going to work out, how, yeah. we can, how we can work together to get something, you know, moving along there. But... It, you talked also talked about affecting change and using your power and regaining your power. And so a lot of what we try to do here is also about education and the importance of voting yeah. and how you use that vote to regain that power. And how do you get people to be engaged and to be excited and want to be on board? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, one of the first things, actually the first um, bill that I prefiled. When I won my election, I got my certificate of election. I was a staffer at LRC, so I knew that once I got my certificate, I could go ahead and write legislation. So I went ahead. You had some power. I, yeah, I, I knew coming in. And the first bill that I wrote was for restoration of voting rights. And, and it was really because when you think about how we effectuate change, if you don't have a voice to begin with, how can you speak up about the things that you are concerned about? How can you push for the change if you're silenced? And Kentucky has been one of the most disenfranchised states in the country. So it is particularly hard to be heard here. And the, the way we get people enthused and involved in the political process is meeting them where they are. We got to listen to folks. And it's not about preaching to someone about their responsibility. It's about understanding what they need and helping them see how this can actually benefit them. And that's hard to do in Kentucky when we have so many corrupt Bad. politicians <laughs> that have been screwing folks for generations. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to tell the new story uh, of, of how we can lift our voices together. And, and I'm inspired to see um, that the hunger for democracy in a true sense still exists. And not only does it exist, people are fired up about it. We are training folks in Hood to the Holler now to um, be relational organizers and to help register people to vote all year. So we're actually launching a campaign to do voter registration all year yeah, this year. Yeah, that's great. Which is typically an off year. There are no off years. Mm -hmm. But when you help people to see what their power can be and what it can do, right, right. and then you're accountable to it, and folks realize, okay, if I invest my time in this, it means something to me, and something can happen, it'll grow. And we have to create that culture, and I've been trying to do that as a legislator. It was where I ran for Senate. And it's why I'm not done. Oh, what's going to happen next? Let's talk about that. You say sure. you're not done. Not in the least. What, what, what's on the horizon? Are we going to get a sneak peek of that? Come on, make oh, an announcement. Yeah, he's, we've already learned yeah. one thing today. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm breaking it all here for you. <laughs> you made a trip, so I yes. got to. There it is. Yes. Put yes. it in. Well, no, I'll, I'll tell you, and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very excited to share that I'm evaluating a run in 2022. All right. Uh, I'm. As, as I mentioned earlier, I come from the church. Uh, everything that I do is, is guided by my faith. So I'm praying on how I can best be an asset. But I'm pretty clear that I haven't run my last race. Um, I believe we need people in leadership that will be accountable to this movement we're trying to build, uh, that will lift up poverty a as a priority and not an afterthought, and that can help us break these barriers down, these silos across Kentucky, so we can build these, these big coalitions to fight for change. And so 
um, you're going to see me in the middle of it, one way or the other. Well, you've been, <laughs> you've, you've been in the middle of it. And so I saw you holding a pen that signed an important document. What yes. was that? Well, tell us about that. So I have, I have a pen in my possession. Um, and when it was put in my hand, I cried. Uh, it was for the executive order that Governor Bashir, Andy Bashir, signed to restore voting rights. Um, and it was for nearly 170,000 Kentuckians. Wow. Um, That's a one big deal. Of, one, of, one of which was my uncle uh, lost his right to vote over 30 years ago for something that is not even a felony anymore. Mm. And to know that people that I love all over Kentucky will now have the chance to be heard, and they want it. If you look back at the tape on election day for the primary and you saw people banging on the doors to get in to vote, mm -hmm. it's because they know how important they are mm -hmm. and they want the chance to fight for change. And uh, my predecessor, Representative Owens, Representative Crenshaw, mm -hmm. uh, folks mm -hmm. have been fighting for this. Senator Neal been fighting for years for this. And for me to be able to come in and pick up the mantle and help get that executive order done, uh, built off of my bill, um, it, it's something that I, I'm so proud of. You know, that, I, that was a, a very proud moment for me, too. I was very excited about that. Yeah. But it also came with a lot of opposition from other people. What do you think that's about? What drives that? Well, you know, the history of disenfranchisement is directly connected to the, our history of chattel slavery in this country. And, <laughs> yeah. and the fact that, you know, the agency and the humanity of those that look like us um, has been denied. And there are some that, well, there are a lot of institutions and people that profit off of that and would prefer to keep it that way. Right. Um, Representative Brown and I sat in committee and talked about the history of black codes and how you can criminalize people on the color of their skin, then take away their right to vote. It was part of a bigger strategy, which I mentioned gerrymandering to you when we were uh, you know, in the break. Right. Mm -hmm. It was part of a bigger strategy of monopolizing political power at our expense. And so it's natural to understand there's going to be tension because this type of change can make folks uncomfortable that have been benefiting from it. But if we help explain and tell the story, and it's, it's there, that by lifting up and fighting for equity in a true sense, we will all benefit more than we ever have. If we can help tell that truth, we can build the momentum to overcome those tensions. And that is what's happening in Kentucky right now and I'm excited to see it. Well and you see this happening you mentioned it you, you see things like this happening this movement happening in Georgia yeah. and with Stacy and you know all of the efforts that she made with her voter you know campaign she didn't let you know losing um, an election That's she right. did not let that stop her she continued to fight on and you know she was like no we're gonna do this this is this is a big deal right now we're yeah. gonna have a seat at the table we're gonna let our voices be heard That's and right. you know and i'm glad that you're getting back into it i mean stacy she took uh that loss and then she refocused her energy but you know she's more popular now than she ever was before so the next time that she runs so in in, in getting kentucky to kind of you know yeah. I'm sure in Georgia they said this is never going to happen because yeah. that's what we say in Kentucky. That it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. But it, it shows that it wasn't like you just said. It wasn't a campaign. It's something that she's been. They've been working on for years. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I've, I've had conversations with uh, with Miss Ab Leader Abrams, and uh, I'm I'm inspired by her mm -hmm. and and all of. Um, the black women in particular. Women that, get that things make, done, Charles. Not only, mm -hmm. not only do black women get mm -hmm. things done, black women are the centerpiece of our pursuit of democracy. Mm -hmm. At every corner, at every turn, when you are looking at a pivotal moment where we're trying to advance the progress of our nation, you're going to find some black women doing all the work. Every time, <laughs> and, every time. And, and I think we have a lot of lessons that we can take from, uh, from Leader Abrams and a lot of folks in Georgia. And... Um, that's what I'm, I'm working on doing. Um, actually, Hood to the Holler was helping um, a lot of the organizations like Fair Fight, New Georgia Project. We were sending volunteers down there. We were helping with Rise to the Polls. Uh, I was doing events uh, every week, and it was because I saw that if we can tell the story of what this can look like in an election, not just in our organizing and in the work we do, but in an election, it can build some momentum. And I know we can do that in Kentucky. It's, it's different for us here in Kentucky. We got our own challenges. But that truth is still a fact that I, I'm excited to build on. And, and I'll just share this. Um, Hood to the Holler launched an action on Sunday, this past Sunday, 
what was that, the ninth, tenth? I all don't know. I kind of still feel like I'm in 2020. <laughs> I, shouldn't, I shouldn't have done that because all the days are blur. <laughs> uh, this pandemic makes it tough. But, but we, we had an action on Sunday for Brianna's Law, and we sent out the call to ask folks to support making sure people can be safe in their homes, something we all want. Mm-hmm. We had over 3,000 people send letters to all the members of the Judiciary Committee on the House and Senate side on a Sunday, and we asked them to do it on Sunday. Mm. And every single congressional district, uh, 108 of the 120 counties, probably got all 120 now, folks from all parts of Kentucky reached out to say that we should be safe in our homes. Mm. We can do this work in Kentucky, too. Now, I want to say something because this is the first time I'm meeting you, but I met you through your commercial (laughs) in Lexington right before the election. And it hit so, you know, Renee is a a good friend of mine. And when I saw that, how it hit dealing with, um, you know, that that one question, it hit so hard. It was it was it was very impressive. First of all, that was that was a great way of of getting uh, your message out. And uh I, I love that. I just wanted to let you know that was one of the things that I, I really love that uh, you did back in during your, your run. Thank you. Thank you. So you are you talking referencing when Renee said and why during that? <laughs> during See, I didn't want to. Yeah. I didn't want to go well, all the way in, but yeah. Well, I'm just I'm just repeating <laughs> well, what she said. Okay, because I'm just we are dealing we, we yeah. are dealing with uh, um, um, structural racism, but uh, the 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 question was. Um, have you been out protesting or, you yeah. know, have you been out? And the que- the answer was no. And the question from Renee was why? <laughs> and, 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 you know, that, that was, that was a powerful moment yeah. in dealing with, you know, from the hood to the holler. And that's when it was like, Oh yeah. Okay. I'm with it. Yeah. I mean, the truth is inevitable. If you lift it up, mm-hmm. you can't deny it, you right. know, and, and that ad you're talking about, all I had to do was say my name. Exactly. And because my name represented the fact that I was putting myself on the front line for Kentuckians through action yeah, because that's what we need. And, you know, even though Brianna was taken away from us and it mm-hmm. has crippled all of us, a, a bit of our essence, even if you didn't know her, a bit of mm-hmm. your essence has been right, taken right. away mm-hmm. because of her life being gone. What is inspired out of that is this movement of folks that are saying, you know what, we got to have the tough conversation. And we got to look in. And, and you know, talking, o- talking about that movement um, that happened over the summer with yeah. the – you know, it, it, it is coming the coming to grips with the Black Lives Matter um, and not just the, the Black Lives Matter organization, the movement itself, yeah, the, movement, yeah. the movement. And with things that are current events that are happening right now with the insurrection of the Capitol and people drawing that, um, you know, that comparison to yeah. the to the two events. Let's uh, talk about that when we come back. It. Yes, we're going to talk about that we're when we come back. Yes. <laughs> During these very difficult times, Community Action Council is on the front lines, caring for our neighbors as we have over the past 55 years. We are safely helping individuals and families access shelter, food, energy assistance, and health care. We're also ensuring families with young children have baby formula and diapers. We're continuing to prioritize education using virtual learning to help us teach our Head Start children and engage our youth. Things look a little different right now, but we are a Community Action Council and we're made for this. Whether through our Head Start at Home virtual learning or in-person learning, the Prep Academy offers you early childhood education to suit your child and family. With either option, children will receive two-thirds of their daily nutrition, have access to health services through our nurse practitioner, and explore family engagement opportunities to help families achieve their goals. The choice is yours. To enroll your child in one of our Prep Academies or in Head Start at Home, call Community Action Council today or go online at comaction.org. Community Action Council is launching Help for Home, a local initiative to raise funds for rental assistance for families who have been economically impacted by COVID-19 and are now facing the threat of eviction. You know, it seems that two of the most frequently used words over the last few months has been the phrase, at home. For some right now, those words are stirring up a sense of fear and uncertainty as thousands in our community are still struggling from the loss of a job or from being underemployed. For others, those words are stirring up a sense of gratitude and a deep desire to help. It is our hope that Help for Home can be the bridge for that help. 
If you would like to contribute, you can donate easily any amount of money by texting the phrase HELP FOR HOME to the number 243725. If you would like to give online or by check, please visit our website at comaction.org. Thank you for helping us help others stay in their homes. Okay, coming right back in our final segment with Charles Booker, having some great conversation and learning a lot from you today, sir. Thanks again for being here, but I want to pick up with the conversation about the insurrection that happened at the Capitol yeah. um, this past week. So um, just give me your thoughts, I guess. I'd like to hear from you, and some of our listeners would like to hear from you about what were you thinking when you were watching this happening in real time? What was going through your mind with that? I was uh, I was watching with my daughters. Uh, I was in between some meetings, and I helped with my daughters in their online uh, uh, learning. Yep, um, he's I, a real mm, dad, everybody. Yeah, I, got a, I got a seventh grade and a preschooler, <laughs> and so we were all sitting around, and you know, I, I flipped the news on, and, and I see this groundswell of folks with uh, Confederate flags and, and Trump signs and, and anti-Semitic. Uh, messages on signs and on their shirts, and they're climbing up the steps of the United States Capitol building. And it reminded me of 9-11. Mm. It reminded me of sitting in class and seeing the plane flying to that second tower mm. and the shock and the trauma. And, uh, and honestly, this resonates so much um, more deeply because of the fact that racism was so prominent and visible um, and one of the images that just really hurts me even right now to think about is one of the women that stormed into the Capitol, United States of America, the people that came in there with firearms and explosives and zip ties so ready yeah, to, to take out elected members. Um, yeah. This lady was walking out and the officer held her hand and yes helped he her get down the steps safely. And while I respect my elders, mm -hmm. And I appreciate making sure someone can get down the steps safely. What happened when one of the elders in my community, Miss Rhonda, was walking to church in a peaceful demonstration saying that we want justice for our community? And it was before curfew. And the officers pulled her to the ground and arrested her. Mm -hmm. They didn't see her as a pillar in our community. They right. saw her color. They saw what she was standing for. And they wanted to take her out. And it hurts because we got to see all of yeah. that. Um, it's been put in our faces. And then... To see the, the elected officials, many of them Republican, um, I hate to have partisan conversations mm -hmm. because I call everybody out, and structural racism does not limit itself to party. That's right. Uh, but in this moment, the majority of Republicans have continued to dig their heels in and, and support, pacify, try to deflect away from an insurrection and, and an act of domestic terrorism. And I think, too, to see it. I think, too, one of the things is when you're looking at that, and I can only speak for myself, when I'm looking at that, I have the hurt of my community yeah. and, and knowing how it was so much different when my community did that. Mm -hmm. I also have the hurt of, wow, they've actually stormed the Capitol. There's n this, is, this is different than anything that I've seen before. This is, where do we go from here? This is, this is no turning back. It hurts your spirit. It, it is so many exactly. levels, so exactly. many levels of hurt in watching that than just the the the, the taking of the, the capital, and yeah. it's 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 a scary moment for me, you know. Yeah. Well, and you know, you have um, people that are trying to draw a comparison between the Black Lives Movement that happened over the summer months, and, and yeah. I'm sure will continue to happen, versus what happened at the Capitol. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that? Because when I look at those two things, I don't see them as being the same, and I'm just yeah. interested in hearing what your perspective is on that. Well, well they aren't the same, and uh, those, including my former law school classmate, uh, Kentucky's Attorney General Daniel Cameron, mm -hmm. um, anyone that is trying to compare them is intentionally misleading. In an, in an egregious way and pacifying racism and white supremacy in a way that hurts everybody. Mm -hmm. Because it's clear that us standing up to ask for justice, to, for everybody to be safe in their homes and marching and protecting law enforcement while we marched is nowhere near 
saying that you're going to overthrow the government and you're going to hurt elected officials. You're going to hit and kill an officer. You're going to beat an officer over the head with the American flag. Mm. You wow. have to compare wow. the two. Mm. It's so intentionally disgraceful. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it, it sets us all back. We need to be real about what we're facing. And that was not a protest. That was domestic terrorism. That was an insurrection. They wanted to take those people out of power. They were going to stop them from keeping Donald Trump in office, although he lost in what he would say is a landslide. Right. Well, that almost left me speechless right there. <laughs> but so what do you, th okay, going long term, short term, yeah. what, do you, what do you think, what kind of effect is this going to have on Kentucky and on, on our country? What do you think about that? Because sometimes yeah. when you open the jar, you can't put it back in. That's true. And so what, kind, what do you think is going to happen next? Well, you know, I, I'm always optimistic because of my faith and because I know that we're more than conquerors. And I know that even though mountains can get big, I know we can move them. And so I don't look at this and lose hope, but it does exhaust you. Mm -hmm. And what you said, and, and, and democracy is fragile. We haven't even fully realized it, but it's fragile. The progress we've made can be wiped out. Um, I'm concerned that if we don't do the deeper work of addressing racism at a structural level, um, of acknowledging and addressing white supremacy and saying that it will not direct our politics, it will not shape our institutions anymore, that the dream that we have of this country could slip away. But I'm hopeful because I don't think we're gonna let that happen. If you think about what happened at the Capitol building, it looked like a last ditch effort of folks that knew things were changing and they knew they couldn't stop it by any other means. And it was an act of desperation. Mm -hmm. And although they were acting out of desperation and they caused some real harm, six people lost their lives. Oh, six. Yeah, six. Uh, and an officer <laughs> recently just committed suicide oh, wow. coming out of that. One of the Capitol Police officers. Although all of that has happened, what you are seeing and continuing to see are people that are still standing up. Those members of Congress went back in there to certify that election. Mm -hmm. People across Kentucky got back on their phones, they got on their computers, and they sent emails all over Kentucky saying that we want to keep people safe in their homes while this is happening. Mm -hmm. We've still been <coughs> registering voters. We've still been training people uh, to lead in their communities. We can still win our future, um, but it's going to require some reconciliation and some true accountability. And you know, to see the, the president of our Senate here in Kentucky weeping over the players from the University of Kentucky taking a knee, but not weeping over why they took the knee, lets me know that we have a whole lot of work we to do. We got a lot of work to do. We, we certainly have a lot of work to do, and that's why I was talking to you. And I'm going to rethink when I think about, you know, changing people's hearts, and I'm going to use your vantage point going forward. Yeah. But, you know, that that's one of the things that, you know, it just puzzles me when you see the outrage for Kentucky, the, the players. Those are young men who are trying to figure it out, who are trying to exercise their voice and figure out what that voice looks like and how they can yeah. express themselves. Um, we, I, I think we got to remember that those are young men who were quietly on a knee, mm. who were quietly on a knee, yeah. you know. So when is it okay, you know, for the black and brown community to protest? When is when is that okay? Yeah. And what platform is the best platform for that? So what, you do, know? You, what, do, you, what do you think um, the FBI has been uh, putting out uh, warnings that there's a possible uh, we could expect more violence at each state capitol? Yeah. Oh, that's um, real. Coming up. That's real. Um, I, I well, I was in the legislature. I would receive death threats myself. Mm. Um, I was there when the armed militia, and they called themselves a militia, uh, were outside of the Capitol, and then they got permission to come in with their firearms and all their ammunition and the vest on, the tactical gear, and they were escorted in. They didn't have to go through the detectors. They were able to walk all over the Capitol. Um, I was there during that time, and you're seeing this fervor that's growing. Um, it was already there before Trump. Yeah. But Trump is is the consummate snake oil salesman. Mm -hmm. He's going to take whatever that void is and exploit it and weaponize it for his gain. And that's what he did to folks that have been dealing with or ignoring or uh, looking for a chance to address the racial anxiety that they have. And it's at a point now where it is causing a direct assault on our government in a very visible way. And so 
all of our state capitals, all of our uh, government uh, entities have to be mindful of that. And uh, I think the concern and the threat of that is very real. And if it's an inside job, then you're going to have to vet the people that are in the place, in these positions, yeah. because <laughs> your, your safety is at, at, at risk. Yeah. Yeah. I wish we had enough time to really dig into defund the police <laughs> uh, because it, it really brings to bear why, like if you unpack what we're trying to really get at, which is fully funding public safety, we actually want public safety. Right. And if you have an institution that historically was built on maintaining uh, the, the remnants of slavery right. and keeping the humanity and the identity, the agency of certain people um, in a, in a relegated place, if you know that that's our history, mm -hmm. you understand why things are still happening this way. And you're seeing, you know, these um, racist and anti-Semitic uh, messages that are in the training for uh, Kentucky State Police. Um, this stuff didn't just go away. And because we tried to ignore and, and we tried to just be nice on the surface, this stuff has been brewing in our institutions. And so there is no surprise that folks that are within law enforcement, now there are a lot of incredible Incredible people in law enforcement. Absolutely. Uh, but the institutions in and of themselves have not dealt with those deep ills. And until we do that, we're going to continue to have this this air of insecurity in our in our structures, this fear of being safe. Now, even in the U.S. Capitol, right. how do you get inside the U.S. Capitol? Somebody right. got to open the door and let right. you in. Right. And then tell me where to go. Yeah. And tell you where to go. Yeah. Wow. This is this. This is this is a heavy conversation. I wish yeah. we had more time with you so we could really, you know, get down. I'll come back. Yeah, yeah. I'll you've got back. you've got to come to Lexington and and Happy sit with us and, and talk with us in Lexington. But when we start thinking about um, going forward, because I never like to get stuck in the moment. Yeah. You yeah. know, especially if that moment. I don't spend a lot of time getting stuck in a bad moment or a happy moment because those are just moments, right? That's, that's wisdom. Yeah, they are. yeah. You, you can't stay in one place too long. But especially when you have something that is trying and it calls for people to be courageous. And courageous doesn't mean that you're not afraid. It right. means that you move forward in spite of your fear right. and you keep doing what is right and you know for the community. And so that's one of the calls that community action agencies like mine and, you know, the thousand community action agencies all across the country, you know, work for is to prevent, reduce, and eliminate poverty in our communities, actually working um, on your platform, so to speak, on eradicating poverty and yeah. what that means for everybody in the community. And so really glad to have you here to talk about that and interested in hearing how you think community action agencies and Head Start programs, because I'm going to tell you, at the onset of COVID, community action agencies and Head Start programs were out on those front lines providing those emergency care services for, you know, the people in our community, because that's our yeah. job is to care for, for everybody in the community that needs us. And so how do you think um, or what do you think community action agencies like ours can yeah. do in our small community that can start there and branch out or maybe start at a larger state level and come back in from, yeah. you know, all sides. What, is, what does that look like for you when you think about it? Well, I actually want to use this to answer one of your earlier questions. I think the way that we get to ending poverty, the way we get to inspiring people to believe things can be different is by realizing where the work happens and prioritizing it and community action. And we, we've, it's benefited my family here in Louisville too speaks to the core of the work we actually have to do. And so instead of your agency being an afterthought, it should be a priority mm -hmm. because what you're doing is helping individuals get the resources they need on the ground. You're meeting where they are, regardless of what their ideology is or how much money they had, uh, uh, what color their skin, what, None of that what matters. pronoun, whether they're walking or using a wheelchair. Right. You see them as human beings and you're there to meet them where they are. What that does is help them get through the day, but it also inspires hope. And if we can take the hope that we get and turn it into a vision of systemic change and not something that we just do after we've criminalized folks or after, you know, we've exploited them and paid them low wages and after, you know, we've demonized folks and said that poverty was a moral failure. If we prioritize this first, 
we can build the leadership on the ground because we are the movement. That's that's what that's Hitchin right. said. We are the change. And and I want to commend you, um, all of you, for your your dedication and understanding the work that we really do have to do. I think it's a ministry, and um, I want to support it. Well, I've never really thought about the work that I do as a ministry, but when you say it, it, it actually is because sure you got to, yeah, you got to care about people more than you care about yourself. Yes, you and do. when you vote, you have to vote. When you've moved up a little bit, you have to vote for who you used to be and not who you are right now. You yeah. know, so there's a lot of effort that, that has to go into that. So we're going to take a short break, but when we come back, I'm going to leave it with you to talk about any more hope that you have, not just for Kentucky, but for the United States of America. Charles Booker, everybody. Whether through our Head Start at Home virtual learning or in-person learning, the Prep Academy offers you early childhood education to suit your child and family. With either option, children will receive two-thirds of their daily nutrition, have access to health services through our nurse practitioner, and explore family engagement opportunities to help families achieve their goals. The choice is yours. To enroll your child in one of our prep academies or in Head Start at Home, call Community Action Council today or go online at comaction.org. Community Action Council is launching Help for Home, a local initiative to raise funds for rental assistance for families who have been economically impacted by COVID-19 and are now facing the threat of eviction. You know, it seems that two of the most frequently used words over the last few months has been the phrase, at home. For some right now, those words are stirring up a sense of fear and uncertainty, as thousands in our community are still struggling from the loss of a job or from being underemployed. For others, those words are stirring up a sense of gratitude and a deep desire to help. It is our hope that Help for Home can be the bridge for that help. If you would like to contribute, you can donate easily any amount of money by texting the phrase HELP FOR HOME to the number 243725. If you would like to give online or by check, please visit our website at comaction.org. Thank you for helping us help others stay in their homes. We're back. You're listening to Let's Talk More Action here, here with our special guest, Charles Booker. It's been a great, great conversation. We want to throw it to you and see what are your final thoughts. Well, first of all, thank you for this chance and thank you for this platform. You're doing some important work um, and I'm honored to be a part of it. You know, I, I come from the struggle. You know, I never thought I'd be in elected office, let alone talking to you about the things that we've talked about and my role in them. Um, and I'm just blown away with humility that I'm, I'm here. I'm alive, you know, and, and I want to do my part in, in my message is always that no matter where you come from, no matter what you look like, no matter how much money you have, no matter what your circumstances are, you matter, you're important. And the struggles you went through, the poverty that you may have faced, they don't define you, they aren't your moral failing, and you deserve to change and transform your future. And I I just believe that this message rings true because it is true, and we all want better. Ultimately, the majority of us, I think. And for those folks, I want to tell you to keep pushing. Folks like Leaders in Community Action understand this. And so connect with those organizations like this, agencies, people that are about uplifting Kentucky. And we can do that together. And then let's have the hard conversations about the challenges we face. Let's continue to make ourselves uncomfortable. And let's continue to organize and lift up the truth of what Kentucky is and not what the national news talks about all the time. Hood to the Holler is a vehicle. Um, It's a platform to lift people up, their voices, give them the tools to be the change. Whether you want to run for office yourself, which I hope you do, or whether you just want to see things better in your neighborhood. And so you can go to hoodtotheholler.org to sign up to volunteer. We have training materials. You can get plugged in. And most importantly, I love Kentucky. I, I love this commonwealth i'm grateful for it i believe in it and i know we're better than what we're seeing now and we're going to win and transform our future together 
You heard it here, Charles Booker. Thanks for being here today. You deserve the chance to transform your f future. You deserve it. Absolutely. Thanks for being here today, Charles. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. You all keep listening. Keep sharing. Share this. We want to blow up. We want everybody to know. And we just finished talking with Mr. Charles Booker. <laughs> Hood to the holler. Hood to the holler. Y'all have a good week. Let's talk more action is on your air.